Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed your first full day under a Democratic uh, administration, sort of. Um, I was hoping that maybe Ilana would be feeling a little better, uh, considering the problems, the very demoralizing problems we were talking about yesterday and I want to talk about again next week. Uh, I actually started to think that what we're doing in this class is probably the most hopeful and uh, encouraging things that thing that we can do for ourselves in this kind of a situation. And I'll try and explain why, I, why, I, why I'm more excited about that than I am about the election on Tuesday. Um, I mentioned that we, the Nonviolent Peace Force is having a big fundraising campaign and they would like some help putting out brochures. And if anyone would have some time to go around to bookstores and stuff in the next couple of days, that's what that top line is about. That's the email address to use. And for those of you who had an interest in working with Berkeley High School, Berkeley International High School, I'm going to be meeting with the director of that in the Meta office from about 4 to 5 today. Okay. So <coughs> as you know today, uh, Jerlina, it, this is part of my uh, ongoing attempt to exploit graduate students. <laughs> Jerlina, who is actually <laughs> getting a, d a PhD in African American Studies, uh, is going to give us kind of a historical and other overview about the civil rights movement and King. And then we have a very special guest today, Prasad, who is from the Sarvodaya movement, which is the – Sarvodaya means the uplift of all, was one of Gandhi's concepts spread to uh, Sri Lanka and elsewhere. And <coughs> I have just uh, been talking the whole morning with him about programs for exchange between our university and their – couple of universities and their grassroots programs in India. So. Any of you who are uh, PAX majors or even if you're uh, PAX majors with uh, emphasis in nonviolence, uh, and we've you know been long saying to you that we don't have a graduate program for you, but now we do. It's uh, in India, and <laughs> <laughs> if you can talk to Prasad <laughs> after our class, and he probably he might be with us at the Meta office this afternoon also. In fact. I think if we can get it arranged between 3.15 and 4, he and I will be having an interview there about the status of Gandhian struggles in India today. And any of you who are free, please feel free to join us. It's, uh, that if you go to 2330 Durant, which is Durant between Dana, uh, Dana and elsewhere, because you know where my own office is. And you go around to the back of the building and there's a long wooden ramp that leads you into our meeting room and then another one step further in. Just make a lot of noise and we'll hear you come out and get you from the office. Okay, so what we're going to do today is Jerlina is going to give us this, this power pack. You've heard of power slides. Well, this is a power pack introduction. I always do this to my colleagues, make them make, give us 50 years of history in 40 minutes. Um, and I hope we'll have time at the end for uh, some questions. If not, hold your questions if you'd be so kind. And we'll hear from Prasad because he's with us only here today. And then we'll take the questions over the weekend. And what I'd like you to be thinking about for next week when we're wrapping up the civil rights movement is a, an overview kind of comparison, if you will, compare and contrast what is similar and what is different between the civil rights movement in our country and a movement on which it was partly based, uh, the freedom struggle in India. Okay, so I'll get out of the way and let Jerlina take it away from us. Can I put this on? You were so clever to wear this. <laughs> Okay. 
Um, okay, so I think it's not absolutely realistic uh, that I'm going to get through all the information today. So I kind of even like to plan for a few minutes um, next Tuesday um, so that I can finish. But what I wanted to start off with, and I wanted to say thank you for the guests that we have today. Um, I wanted to start off with this idea that what we generally, what I first came to the civil rights movement with was the very superficial idea. Um, it's a very superficial idea of what the civil rights movement was, um, which is what I wrote up here. In the 1960s in the South, black ministers led a nonviolent movement for the civil rights of black Americans, which isn't entirely untrue, but it's this idea that it's, it's very much like the tight top of an iceberg. Um, and in reality, a civil rights movement like an iceberg, it has a top that we can see that we're generally knowledgeable about, but there's also all of this that's underneath the surface um, that we really have to acknowledge to get the real sense of what the civil rights movement was, or in that case, to get the se real sense of what this iceberg is. Um, so what I'd like to do today is really start to unpack almost word by word this, this statement so we get a better sense, not only of the civil rights movement, but what we can learn from it um, as students of nonviolence, but also as activists, because I know that many of you um, are, are activists. So the first thing, um, so in this sense that I want, I'm just going to reiterate, um, if we think of the civil rights movement, uh, each part of the sentence is like an iceberg. So in the 60s, in the South, black ministers led a nonviolent social movement. So all of these different things um, are like the type of top of, my, of an iceberg. If we think of the civil rights movement is, um, as only this part above the water, we fail to comprehend the true reality. Some elements of this quote unquote true reality are revealed by looking at the civil rights movement. Um, and these different elements of the true reality include, first, is th this idea of the oneness of past, present, and future. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the future, or excuse me, the past, the history that came before the civil rights movement, and how that directly impacted the nature of this movement. Um, how our actions have, it may not have immediate uh, visible effects, but they do make significant impacts later, and we'll see this. For example, um, Ella Baker was one of the civil rights movement leaders, and um, the organizing that she did, say, 10, 20 years before the movement, had significant uh, direct impacts during, during the movement. Um, also, what I'm going to draw out of this lecture is this idea that Swadeshi, this idea of starting with change at home or change within ourselves, wasn't a hard and fast rule in this movement, but we can definitely see how people working within their individual communities, whether it's in Chicago, New York, or Nairobi or London, that people ov over the world that were becoming active, they didn't necessarily have to go down to the south um, to impact this movement, rather where they were um, also had effects uh, worldwide, but particularly, particularly on the civil rights movement. Um, another point that I am pushing to get to the lecture so that I can bring out um, is that the civil rights movement was indeed a people's movement that we like to talk about King because he was significant. Um, he was an amazing, amazing, human being, leader, Christian, et cetera, but it, it, it indeed in, involved tens and thousands of people, and so I want to bring this, this out. Um, there was also this combination, and this goes into our, the way that we talk about King of the Movement, that it was a combination of both leadership, of having someone strong guiding the movement, but also this idea that so many people were empowered to create change in their communities and their lives. Um, Okay, I'm, I'm going to go just start, start the lecture, and the other few ideas will come up. So starting with in the 1960s. And I'd like to suggest that instead of this idea of in the 1960s, it's more like in the 1960s after 100 years of anti-racist activism. Okay, so in 1865, slavery was abolished in the United States. And immediately after, there were some p political rights granted to people, particularly in the South. We had um, African Americans elected to public office, we even had uh, into Congress, and we had two black senators, which didn't happen for many, many decades, decades, decades after. So it's this idea that African Americans were starting to become active um, politically in 1865, 67, 68, so this is kind of really early history. We also had black leaders who were emerging in the turn of the century, like Du Bois and, um, and Booker T. Washington. Uh, du Bois was born in Massachusetts. He ended up going to Harvard to get his PhD. He ended up going to study sociology, before it was sociology, in Germany. Uh, so extremely well-trained. 
And he was not only an intellectual and a very successful one, um, but he was also an activist. So he, he was one of the founders of the NAACP. Um, he spoke out during World War I uh, with this, this campaign of the double V, so victory at home and victory abroad. And um, through the NAACP, really the early years was dedicated, uh, dedicated a lot of time to making noise about lynching. And so while they had a main office, lynching, lynching. Um, so in a sense they were doing um, anti-violent work, not necessarily non-violent work, but they would, in, in their office in Harlem, they would post, they would um, have a big sign, say someone was lynched today, so that people knew, that, so that this, this, this violence wouldn't go on, unheard. Um, okay, but there, so these, the, these black leaders had different ideas of what black, act, black activism would be. Um, Washington believed that we need to stay a little more quiet while we get training. So he developed the Tuskegee Earth. He became active um, at the Tuskegee um, Institute, getting, getting black workers trained. So moving on, so we had this idea of political rights, black leaders and black intellectuals. But the activist base, particularly in Harlem, had a lot more to do with nationalism. So we have uh, Marcus Garvey, who's coming from Jamaica and suggesting that black people need to unite. Um, we had, there were thousands and thousands of dues-paying members who had this idea that they were going to um, create a black nation. We also had um, a lot of communist Marxist activity also in Harlem. And they were particularly active with the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. And um, again, there was, they were extremely active, but there was this contentious relationship between the nationalists and, and the communists and the Marxists. There was also concurrent um, activity beyond the, what I just spoke of. So we had, again, anti-lynching struggles. We had reparation struggles. We had um, a different uh, battles for voter registration. So really this idea that black activism emerged in the 1960s is not a reality. The reality is there was tons of acti activism, particularly anti-racist and civil rights activism, uh, extending between, significantly between, the abolishment of slavery in 1865 and the, and the civil rights movement, which actually started uh, in 1954. Okay, so the idea that the civil rights movement was a 60s movement is not really true. Um, it, it started in 54 with Brown versus Board when um, the separation of uh, the public schools were, uh, I guess segregation in public schools was outlawed. And in 1955, we had the official kind of activism starting beyond the um, legislative changes. We had the Montgomery bus boycotts. And so they started in 54, lasted until 56. And they, I mean, it was significant because it was a people's movement that succeeded. And we had bus boycotts that had happened before. We had had sit-ins that had happened before. We even had freedom journeys um, that had happened before. But this was the first one that was significant. It was successful. And these people stayed off the buses for 381 days. Um, these were women, you didn't see them marching in their, in their fields to work, to work all day as maids and then marching home. We had people sacrificing their cars when cars were really expensive um, to drive people around. So you had intense organi organization. Um, and you also had these mass meetings sometimes twice a week, sometimes more, where people were, again, after marching to their jobs in the morning, working all day, marching home, feeding their children, they would then congregate at these mass meetings um, and talk about beef and, and this freedom struggle and what this meant and, and how they were going to win and how they were going to be victorious. Okay, so this is, hopefully we've de deconstructed this a little bit, um, unpacked this idea that it was a 60s movement, and then I'd like to unpack this idea that it was a Southern movement. Um, so again, this brings us back into history. And first of all, there I'd like to talk about, there were two great migrations of African Americans to the North. And these migrations really blurred the lines between the Southern, quote unquote, Negro and the Northern Negro. Um, before we had African Americans who were living in Philadelphia for hundreds of years, I mean, well, that they knew themselves as Northern African Americans. Or African Americans from New York who were, who were grounded in the North. But now you had thousands, waves of thousands and thousands of workers, primarily men, who were boarding trains and buses, et cetera, and making a new life in the North. The, the second migration, which was most significant to the Civil Rights Movement, happened between um, 1907 and 1929. And it really brought up this idea 
of the old Negro, i.e. the, which is a pejorative term, I might add, um, where it's the, the southern Negro who is slow, who is lazy, who had images of, of minstrels. Um, and this was the idea that um, southern Negroes were silly and um, they were like clowns, whereas the northern Negroes were educated, they were um, politically aware and active, they were well-dressed, they were modern, they were contemporary. Um, and this was not only an idea that was propagated by media, but particularly propagated by uh, black people in the North, and <laughs> I guess that's no surprising, um, but also particularly pro propagated by um, artists and intellectuals like, like Du Bois. Uh, you also have this exchange um, which further blurred the lines between Northern African Americans and Southern African Americans. There was constant exchange. So people would move to the North, but then spend their summers down South. Or they'd move to the North, um, and they everybody, <laughs> like their congregation would move North. They still had a kind of a Southern community up North. A lot of, uh, a lot of kids would spend years in the South with, say, their grandparents, um, and then come up and live in the North. So there was this constant exchange and this idea of home um, for many people was actually down south, even if their permanent residence was in the north. Um, and then moving further um, into the civil rights movement, the people who were involved and the different organizations were involved were both um, southern and northern. We had, for example, a group called In Friendship. In Friendship was founded by Ella Baker, um, Stanley Levinson, and Bayard Rustin. Ella Baker was born in the south. Uh, she went to college in the south, and then she moved up north and started becoming politically active there. Bayard Rustin was born in, in Pennsylvania. He had become active a little bit in the South, but he was primarily a Northern person. Finally, uh, Stanley Levison was very much a Northern person. Okay, I just, okay, good. Um, so he, this idea that um, the civil rights, okay. Um, so in friendship, uh, the organization's task was to raise money for uh, the bus boycotters in Mississippi. So here was a group of people who originated from both the North and the South. Their headquarters were in the North, but all of their fundraising activities were for the South. So this was further extending this idea that having, having this movement as just a Southern movement um, in opposition to it being a, a Northern movement or a kind of a national movement um, is problematic because again, we had organizing in both places. Um, I guess um, next we have also this idea that the great campaigns, um, Montgomery, the Montgomery bus boycotts, the sit-ins in Nashville, the freedom rides, um, and I'm gonna go through these later, that indeed they were in the South, but a lot of the civil rights movement had more to, um, it was more than just these particular campaigns. It, had the, it was about this idea of changing the nature of the United States and its culture. And so we had journalists, artists, activists, educators, um, and the list goes on, who were active in the North, in the West, in the Northwest, really throughout the country, people were standing up and making change um, in their own communities, and people's minds were being changed, not only in the South. Um, one, one example of that is in New York, there was an organization uh, that was founded in 1961 by an artist named uh, Romeo Bearden, and it was called Spiral. And these, ar these artists got together and they created these various art shows that would travel throughout the United States. And they were speaking out against lynching, um, and they were speaking up for the bus boycotts, and they were really trying to get the idea out that this was um, significant to them as New York-based artists. So again, it's this idea that, this is kind of bringing it back, that it was not just in the South, that the activity was really going on throughout the country. Um, I'm gonna skip one and just go to the kind of final point in really pushing this idea forward is that I, I feel like I've, I've pushed it into a space where it's, okay, it's not just the South, it's also the North, but this civil rights movement also had a very international um, component. Um, first of all, we know that it was very much influenced by the Indian struggle um, and their independence um, let's see, there was also the impact of the Cold War, which we could really spend a few lectures on, the impact of the Cold War and Cold World politics. But it was very clear that um, Washington 
they were reacting to King, to the Civil Rights Movement, to the different activity with a very um, developed awareness of how this was affecting their ability to spread democracy abroad, when in fact democracy wasn't really happening at home. Um, and this was being pushed into the media globally because it was so, it was now so obvious. Did you have a question? Um, it, it, um, so the question is, does this fit in with the idea of non-embarrassment? Um, it, it does. And so there was actually, there was an exchange between Martin Luther King Jr. and, um, and Kennedy, which had to do with this particular idea of just real, like we're not explicitly trying to embarrass you, but we are trying, we have to get these ideas out. We have to um, demonstrate to the world what is going on. So I don't know how well that answers your question, but we, 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 can, we can certainly discuss it. kind of making a point and getting a fuller understanding that it wasn't just um, a movement that was of the 60s and a movement that was of the South, um, but also this idea that it was black ministers or, or just a black, or a black people's movement. And it certainly was, but it also involved white activists um, and particularly influenced by uh, Jewish activists. And so the white activists that were involved who weren't, particular, who weren't necessarily involved in the church were people like Edie Nixon, who was a labor activist, A. Philip Randolph, who also was also a labor activist. Um, and that also, it wasn't only African-American activists, but you also had Caribbean activists, um, like Stokely Carmichael, who became active towards the end of the, towards the end of the move, towards the end of the movement. The black church activists are pretty obvious. So we have King, we have people like um, Vernon Johns and Howard Thurman. You have the entire SCLC, which is, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And so it's a group of, of black ministers. But the idea is you had, um, oh, excuse me. So you had black ministers but you also, and, and black people, but you also had Jewish friends like um, Jean Steinberg, who was, she had worked at the SNCC office, became very close with Ella Baker. You had Stanley Levinson, who was one of the advisors um, of King. And you had really countless others. You also had um, FOUR, the Fellowship of Reconciliation, and CORE, which was a, became a branch of FOUR, the Congress of Racial Equality, which was certainly an interracial group, certainly a combination of white activists and black activists working together. And finally, what, what becomes kind of significant is this idea of who made the ultimate sacrifice for the movement. And many, King died for the movement, a lot of black, a few black activists died for the movement, but so did white activists. And I found it very interesting that um, the organization that later became the Black Panthers, which was founded in Alabama, they kind of were inspired to start organizing after the death of two white activists. Um, and so I, I found that very, very interesting. Um, finally, just to further push forward this point, is that not only were the it was black, white, and Jewish activists. It was also ministers and lawyers and grassroots activists and students and farmers and educated and church members and, uh, and the list goes on. It was men, women, um, people who were gay, who were straight, who were rich, who were poor, who were secular, communist, capitalist. I know I'm saying this fast, but the idea is that this was really a people's movement, that it wasn't just ministers. It was people from all sorts of different backgrounds who were able to um, participate in the ways, in many different ways. Um, let's see. So unfortunately, this idea of a people's movement, I mean, it, people certainly talk about it, but it's difficult um, in part because there were so many factions. So what happens is you'll get a book on the women in the civil rights movement or Bayard Rustin, or it, and, and it's been hard to talk about um, all of these people at once. And so I'm struggling with it to an extent that I'm gonna skip to the ministers 
um, and kind of the front line leaders. Um, you had Ella Baker, for example. She is one of these people that often gets thrown in with the people. I mean, she was a person, right? She was, but she wasn't. She didn't have a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> she was a woman. Uh, she was married for 20 years, but nobody knew it. So people thought she was either a lesbian or she was single or something like that. Um, she um, was old. She felt one of the reasons like, that Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, SCLC ministers weren't so interested in working with her was because she was an older woman. Um, let's see, we also had people like Septima Clark, who became the director of the Highlander Folk School. The Highlander Folk School, I would suggest, really brought grassroots organizing to us, to the US. I mean, it was, it was really intense, and she was the director of the school. This is a black woman raised in the South. Diane Nash, another person, a person we probably won't hear of. She was raised in Chicago. Uh, she was a candidate for Miss America. Uh, she went down to Nashville, was extremely upset about the segregation practices there, uh, became involved, and one of the, pinnac the kind of pinnacle moments of, I think, the Civil Rights Movement is she went, goes up to the mayor and says, do you think that the segregation between black people and white people is moral? <laughs> and he stutters, and he says, no, I don't think so. Do you think that uh, the segregation, that lunch counters should be desegregated? Yes. And I mean, it's just like, oh my God, here's this, this young woman, she's, oh, I mean, <laughs> I'm so excited. Because this is a person that's standing up. This is not King, this is not Abernathy, this is not um, even Bayard Rustin. This is this young student, woman, our age, who was so pivotal, pivotal um, in the desegregation of the South. So you have these different women involved. You also had men involved who we don't hear so much about. Um, John Lewis is one who was born extremely poor in, I think it was Mississippi, Alabama. OK, ex ex extremely poor. And there was a concern that he didn't speak well enough, that he didn't dress well enough. He was a little rough around the edges. But he also became extremely influential um, in Nashville. He was trained very, very rigorously um, in nonviolence, and he became a leader in the movement. Um, and then we have people who we do hear a little bit more of, Wyatt T, um, they call him Wyatt T, um, uh, Reverend Abernathy, and um, other ministers in the SCLC. So what I'm really trying to tease out here is certainly there were ministers who were willing to give their lives, and most significantly and most re re regularly, it was giving their livelihood, because these people were getting sued left and right, um, to, um, to become intimidated. Um, let's see. So we have this idea of it's a people's movement. We also have these leaders who are coming from different backgrounds. Um, and then we have King. OK. So King got involved. Can I just take this one? Here. Um, King got involved in the civil rights movement in 1965 officially, but his involvement in the black freedom struggle really started well before then. He was born um, to a black Baptist minister who was also, a, well, he was a third generation black Baptist minister. He became a third generation black Baptist minister. And so very, very much um, involved in the church and exposed to the church. He ends up going to Morehouse and, and, and beginning to explore the idea of him becoming a minister there. Um, he ends up going to Crozer Seminary. Um, and studying Christianity there, which I, I felt was significant because he's, he's starting to move north and starting to explore these kind of broad ideas of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a minister, what it means um, to create, well, a kind of, I guess, Christian practice that, that set right with him instead of just adopting what it was that was around him. Um, he ends up going to Boston University and he received his PhD in 1955. Also significant because King's idea was not to become the greatest civil rights leader, that, rather his idea was, I wanna, I wanna be a professor. I want to teach people about ideas. I wanna have an office. I wanna, I wanna be kind of live a little bit of a secluded life. But that was really far from what he ended up leading. So, he was an intellectual, 
but also, um, even though he wanted to kind of leave a, lead a secluded life, he had really proven his oratory skills, both at Crozer and at Boston University. So um, with a combination of his intellect and his speaking abilities and his, his family background, he was appointed a minister at Dexter uh, Church in Montgomery, Alabama. That was, it was, I'm going to try to run through this, but it was while he was at Dexter that he became involved in the Montgomery bus boycott. And it's this idea that Mont Mont Montgomery bus boycott was already going on, or had, it had been started, Rosa Parks had um, courageously decided not to move. Uh, there was some idea that, okay, this is our chance to really move, to create a bus boycott. Uh, the Mississippi Improvement Association was founded, and then King was appointed the president of this association. So he became involved, and through his involvement, he really, really proved himself as a leader. The kind of speeches he gave, the kind of discipline that he provided was really, really significant. But what was also significant was he had advisors. Um, he had advisors particularly for nonviolence. And so he first uh, brought down a man named Bayard Rustin, who I've mentioned a few times already today. Write it on the there. Um, okay, so Bayard Rustin was one of my favorite people of the Civil Rights Movement because he was, he wasn't, well, he was very eclectic. Um, he was born as a Quaker in Pennsylvania to a very interesting family, um, becomes involved in different kind of activism, goes to spend some time in the East Village, very bohemian kind of life, um, and uh, he ends up being one of the founders of the Congress of Racial Equality. Um, he gets brought down to assist Martin Luther King Jr. really think about nonviolence, how it could be applied, how they can sustain the movement through nonviolence, really this very rigorous academic, pretty much scientific uh, study of nonviolence. But there's a problem. Uh, Bayard Rustin is not only bohemian, which isn't really welcomed in the South, he's also gay, and people know this. And the SCLC, well, what becomes the SCLC, but the black ministers, um, and really people were concerned that, that this would raise some controversy that the movement wasn't quite ready for. So uh, Glenn Smiley of CORE uh, then came down to the South, and, and he kind of replaced Rustin and furthered this study of nonviolence. He provided training. He really enabled this movement to understand, and King in particular, what it is at non what is nonviolence. Um, particularly what is nonviolence from a Gandhian perspective. Um, so with the help of these, these two advisors and with the work of the people, clearly this bus boycott was tremendously successful. In 57, the SCLC was founded with the idea that they are going to apply nonviolence and Gandhian principles to social change, that they are going to push forward this bus boycott in creating a broader social movement. Um, and in 1959, Martin Luther King Jr. makes a trip to India. He was invited by Nehru, and he met people like uh, Vinoba Bhave, who will study next semester, um, who was a student of, of Gandhi. Uh, this was really an opportunity for King to further understand what it is, uh, what Gandhian nonviolence is, how it was applied. Um, he met 500 members of the Shanti Sena. Like, he saw that nonviolence is real and that it works. He was so inspired. It, it, it's really tremendous because he continually talks about the influence, um, not only of this trip, but of, of Gandhi on this movement afterwards. In 1961 and 1962, there is, so with this said, there's still this idea that something has to happen. Um, that, that this movement has to be sustained further than the, the Montgomery bus boycott. And in 1961 to 1962, there is further activity that happens in Albany, Georgia. Now, this was a difficult movement, which I'm not going to go into too much today, but this was difficult because we had factions arise between some members of SNCC, the students who were active in Nashville and, and who came later, um, and between the SCLC and King. 
we had King and, and, and the different ministers really dedicated to this idea of nonviolence, but we had doubts arising, and a lot of the other people were saying, wait a second, we're being beat up, we're being terrorized, and you want us to love these people? Do you think this is going to work? And they were not so happy with, um, they felt like King was kind of um, taking the spotlight off of the people of the movement, um, and again, pushing this towards a leaders-based movement. This was really upsetting to the young people, the students, the poor people, the farmers, et cetera, who were working really hard, and they felt like they weren't getting their, their just due. Um, so again, Albany was, I would say, just, uh, suggest significant because there was a little doubt arising in people um, about, about if nonviolence really worked. In 1963, though, uh, we have Birmingham. And people start organizing in Birmingham, which is also known as Bombingham. It is the most segregated city in the South, intense terrorism, and it's called Bombingham because there are basically bombs going off all the time, particularly in black homes and black churches. This is the place where four young black girls were um, murdered on uh, Sunday morning. So, I mean, it's like intense violence. But what's really amazing about Birmingham is because it's so successful. This was a place where Martin Luther King Jr. wrote his letter from the Birmingham jail. And um, among other things, he, well, first of all, this became a very widely read letter, uh, which is why I thought it was so significant that he very clearly, in one of the first pages of the letter, says, this nonviolence, um, it's very clear. We have a very clear strategy. And there are basically four steps. One, it's a collection of the facts to determine whether injustices are alive. So we're not just marching because we feel like we need to. This is part of a strategy. The first strategy, of course, is, is um, again, collecting facts. The second is negotiation. We're willing to work this out. We want to talk with the, the white governor or mayor or, or business people. We're really trying to do this through conversation and dialogue. The third is self-purification. And the fourth, this is the final step is direct action. So he laid this out in a letter particularly um, directed to uh, white Christian ministers, but of course it was read by many people throughout the movement. So it's, pr it's pushing this idea from nonviolence to kind of theory, this, this idea that nonviolence is something to this idea of these are the four steps of nonviolence. This is a method of social change, a very clear and scientific method. Um, Okay, so Birmingham was a great success. 1963, we have the I Have a Dream speech. Um, you yeah. <laughs> well, uh, and so they clearly wanted Birmingham. They wanted um, voter rights, but there was, a, there was some other. They had a whole, like, list of demands they wanted, um, and one of them was the integration of downtown eating facilities and um, clerks that were selling at the different stores. So they had, they had quite a few demands um, in Birmingham. So in um, 1963, we have, the I have a, we have the March on Washington, which was organized by Bayard Rustin uh, and A. Philip Randolph. And in 1964, Martin Luther King Jr. is awarded the Nobel Peace Prize um, and goes to Oslo and, and receives that. Now in 1965, we have, it's uh, Selma, Alabama, and so we have, I mean, it's a mass movement, okay? Um, and on, let's see, I guess I don't even have the date here, but what was significant is they, it was also voting rights, um, and they're trying to organize a walk from Selma, Alabama to uh, Montgomery. And on their first attempt for this walk, we have thousands of people organized, and they're trying to cross this bridge. And on the other side, they see state troopers. And it's this question of, are we going to progress, or are we going to turn back? And then there, this, this conflict ensues. And I mean, I, I wish I had footage of it, because you see the people, uh, the stormtroopers and the police, with these billy clubs just starting to beat people. and horses trampling people, and I mean, it, it is just absolute chaos. 70 African Americans were hospitalized, 
uh, and 70 more were treated for injuries. This became known as Bloody Sunday, and it was significant for several reasons, but one was this was telecast throughout the world, particularly throughout the United States, and it was enraging. Uh, not only for the black people who were involved getting um, beat up, but for people who were watching this and saying, wait a second, we, again, we are getting beat up. And, we, and, and so how does this nonviolence apply to that? Are we supposed to, and I get the sense that this turn the other cheek idea that we talked about early in our class, um, it was not fully understood um, in the sense of, I don't want to turn the other cheek and get hit again. I want to do something. I want to stand up. And then by, by 65, you had different armed revolutions that are going on in Africa. We have the Vietnam War is getting started. So you have these, these examples of violence in other places. And I mean, we also have people who are speaking out, black activists in the United States saying, this is ridiculous. We need to fight back. And so, again, some of it was this moment for, for many people who began to seriously question um, nonviolence. Two days later, though, um, King organized a second march from Selma to Montgomery. And these were primarily faith-based uh, faith organizations and people. And they successfully did march from Selma to Montgomery. And it was likened to the salt march, salt walk. Um, this idea that all of these people were going to come together and successfully make a stand against this injustice. Um, and this, as I, I get the sense, as much as the first march was enraging, the second march was extremely inspirational. Uh, let's see. Now, Selma, for many people, really marked the end of as the traditional civil rights movement. But in 66, for King, he was certainly not done. He began organizing in the North. He organized nonviolent workshops for, for different people in the North, including gang members. Um, in, in the same year, he led 40,000 people in Chicago. This is on July 10th on Freedom Sunday. And on that day, he was met by an angry mob. Um, and it included the head of the American Nazi Party. And King said that he had never experienced such hate, even in the worst moments in the South. In 1967, King spoke out, spoke out against Vietnam. Um, and he also was really starting to speak a lot about black power during this point. He was absolutely not for violence, but he was for this idea that um, black people did need to begin to understand themselves and their history. Uh, in 1968, he was assassinated in Memphis um, while in support of the sanitation worker strike. So this, in about five minutes, <laughs> was Martin Luther King Jr.'s life. Um, and we can see that it was very intense um, and intensely inspirational. And so that's back to this idea, that it was not just black ministers, um, that people were involved. There are leaders of different backgrounds. Um, and, and also there was. Um, it wasn't just many ministers, but uh, there was also this inspirational leader who was King. OK. Um, let's see. And just a, one more kind of word on that idea between the people and King is that there are these two ways that people were beginning to conceptualize leadership. Um, and the first, so Martin Luther King Jr., for example, let's get this one. We're done at. I think I might be able to do it. Let's, let's make this work. Okay. Um, so we had for King and members of the SCL to see this idea that you needed strong moral leadership. You needed someone to really guide the movement, like Jesus, like Gandhi, and then it became like King. And um, I feel like one of the sermons, I guess, that he delivers that really puts this idea forth in a way that I can really understand and, and pretty much agree with is a drum major instinct, where he talks about um, many of us have this drum major instinct that we want to be the leaders. We want to be in front. We want to be in charge. We want to be the drum major. Um, but for King, it's about if you're doing that, it needs to be you're being the drum major for peace or the drum major for justice, that you're being a leader for something that is beneficial um, and in line with, with Christianity, for example. 
I'm just going to read a little bit quickly of this. It's an excerpt from that speech. He writes, every now and then, I guess, we all think realistically about the days um, when we will be victimized with what is life's common denomination, that thing we call death. We all think about it, and every now and then I think about my own death, and I think about my own funeral, and I don't think of it in a morbid sense. Every now and then I ask, what is it that I would want said? And I leave the word to you this morning. If any of you around, if any of you are around, when I have to meet my day, I don't want a long funeral. And if you get somebody to deliver the eulogy, tell them not to talk too long. Every now and then I wonder what I want them to say. Tell them not to mention that I have a Nobel Peace Prize. That isn't important. Tell them not to mention that I have three or four hundred awards, because that's not important. Tell them not to mention where I went to school. I'd like to somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like somebody to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. I want you to say that day that I tried to be right on the war question. I want you to be able to say that day that I did try to feed the hungry. And I want you to be able to say that day that I did try in my life to clothe those who were naked. I want you to say that day that I did try in my life to visit those who were in prison. I want you to say that I tried to love and serve humanity. Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major, Say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness. And all the other shallow things will not matter. I won't have any money to leave behind. I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind. But I just want to leave a committed life behind. So this um, sermon in particular really puts this idea that, yes, I'm a leader. Yes, I'm a drum major. But I'm a drum major for righteousness. I'm a drum major for peace. Um, but this, I, this particular way of, um, let's see, um, of organizing was really not welcomed by everyone, um, and not everyone, particularly meaning Ella Baker, who, um, as I'd mentioned before, was also a leader in the movement, and she became highly involved in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. She was, in, in a sense, the backbone of the committee. And she really felt like this idea of popular education, of consensus, of empowering, um, whether it's sharecroppers or students or, or women, that that was really the central element, that that was really going to be the revolutionary element of this movement. And it's really n no coincidence that she was one of the founders of the Young Negro Lead League of Cooperation, she, like many of us here, she was a co-op, right? She believed this idea of people coming together and empowering themselves, which she felt, um, and many SNCC members felt, that this was in contradiction to the leadership style of SCLC and of King. Um, let's see. So moving right along, um, this idea. So it wasn't just led, but it was also empowered. It was also an issue of empowerment, and it being a nonviolent social movement. Now, it's very clear that King, the students in Nashville, uh, the members of the SCLC, members of CORE, were absolutely dedicated to principled nonviolence, to Christian nonviolence, to Gandhian nonviolence. Um, they infused their Christianity um, with, with nonviolent action. And it's very clear that many of them were prepared to die. Uh, in Taylor Branch's story of historical overview, Parting the Waters, a uh, story of the civil rights movement. I mean, he, he, he details how students were writing their wills before they head out on the freedom ride. That they were contacting their relatives and saying, I might not talk to you again um, because I'm, I'm heading on a bus down south. And this concern was very real. Um, and, and I'm going to read a little bit of, no, maybe I won't. Um, okay. So first, this idea of King being very committed. He not only had an intellectual training via Crozer and Boston University in the study of Christianity and Christian nonviolence, um, but he also, this is very interesting, he had a relationship 
particularly with Howard Thurman, particularly through the book Jesus and the Disinherited. We had a s excerpts of that in our reader, and um, Howard Thurman was a, he was a minister who was one of the founders of CORE as well, and he was one of the first he was a he was one of the first ministers to create an integrated church, and it was in San Francisco. Um, moving along, we had Rustin, Smiley, Lawson, and th so these are the, these different ministers who, either through their Quaker practices or through their travels to India, became extremely extremely dedicated to nonviolence. In Nashville, the students there were introduced to nonviolence through James Lawson. James Lawson um, was born in Ohio. He um, was a conscientious objector. He ended up traveling to India. I believe he spent three years there. Um, he was studying nonviolence, studying the life of Gandhi. And while there, he read about the Montgomery bus boycott. He immediately came back. He actually ended up going first to a study at Oberlin, and there King found him and said, you have to get involved. So he, he gets involved with CORE, he's sent down south to Nashville, and he starts training people. And he starts this, what becomes, in a sense, a nonviolent um, institute. And it was likened to like, the West Point of nonviolence. It was so disciplined, and it was so intense and rigorous. And it's, it's really proven, because the students that he trains, Diane Nash, John Lewis, um, James, Bernard Lafayette and, and, and several others, this core group of people who are intensely trained by Lawson, they're sent on the Freedom Rides, they're sent to Birmingham, they're in Albany, so they're, they're, they're really kind of these, they become the leaders of these nonviolent training. Where did you say they were born again? Um, Nashville. Mm -hmm. It was, there was no name. He, he was just teaching um, workshops in churches. So he was doing this intense training, and these Nashville students um, were really at the forefront of the development of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, and of course, the sit-in movement was really pushed forward through their vigilance and their understanding of nonviolence. Finally, you had, or not finally, almost finally, um, you had, again, CORE and Nashville students coming together for the Freedom Ride. The Freedom Ride started in 61, so this is the year after the students had started, and uh, they were organized by the Congress of, of Racial Equality. After sending the first wave of activists, I believe there were about eight people, um, they realized that they need a little more support, and Diane Nash, one of the national students, says, we're on it, we're sending students. And even though they, they had a sense of what they were up against, uh, it's still really, really intense, and I'm going to read just a little bit of what that experience was like for those Nashville students who head down south. Um, and I'm sorry, the Freedom Rides were an attempt to integrate the, um, they had colored waiting rooms and white waiting rooms, and also the buses themselves, you were not allowed to sit in, in, in an integrated fashion, so they were trying to desegregate the um, interstate travel. Okay, so this is a description of what's going on in the Freedom Ride. So they're, they're getting on the buses in the north, they're heading down south, and then they want to get off the bus, which becomes quite a problem. They want to go into the color, they want to sit in the white waiting rooms, uh, and that becomes a problem. So this is one of, uh, this is John Lewis's experience with the Freedom Ride. He's facing a, uh, this is, he's getting off one of the buses. He says, facing a battery of cameras, microphones, and notepads, Lewis got halfway through an answer to the first press question before falling strangely silent, Transfi transfixed by what he saw coming up behind the reporters. Norman Ritter, the Time Life Bureau chief from Atlanta, reacted to Lewis's face by turning to confront the dozen white men who had been standing in the door. He held up both arms to create a boundary for the interview. The men brandishing baseball bats, bottles, and lead pipes passed past him, pushed past him. One of them slapped Mo Levy of NBC News, and this first act triggered a seizing and smashing of cameras and equipment. Let's all stand together, said Lewis, as the Freedom Riders retreated backward along the enclosed lo loading platform. Hemmed against the railing that ran against the retaining wall, they stood helplessly as white men barreled into them. Some of Lewis's group jumped, some were pushed, and some were literally thrown over the railing onto the roofs of cars, 
parked in the post office lot below. Those who did not take their luggage with them were soon pelted with their own suitcases. Above on the platform, reporters who objected or who tried to take photographs of the attack were set upon by a small mob whose full fury was now released. Down below, the Freedom Riders realized that whites who had been um, secluded at various observation points were closing in on them from all directions. Some stalked and some charged, egged on by a woman in a yellow dress who kept yelling, get those niggers, fighting panic, the Freedom Riders made their way to two nearby Negro taxis and jumped to send the seven females to safety. The first taxi, filled with screams and shouts, found one of the two exits from the parking lot choked off by a stream of angry whites. Swerving around, bombarded with conflicting advice, the driver found the other exit blocked by cars. This was too much for him. He told the Freedom Riders that he was going to abandon the taxi. While some of his passengers tried desperately to claim calm him, others looked back in horror at the loading platform. They, along with several Alabama reporters standing closer, saw a dozen men around Jim Swerg, the white Wisconsin exchange student at this in Nashville. One of the men grabbed Swerg's suitcase and smashed him in the face with it. Others slugged him to the ground, and when he was dazed beyond resistance, one man pinned Swerg's head between his, his knees so that the others could take turns hitting him. As they steadily knocked out his teeth and his face and chest were streaming with blood, a few adults in the perimeter put their children on their shoulders to view the carnage. A small girl asking what the men were doing, um, and her father replied, while they're really carrying on, the freedom riders in the nearby taxi turned away in sickened hysteria. Um, I'm just going to skip down. Um, so Segan Thaler, which is one of Kennedy's aides, is down there, and he sees a woman um, being followed and beat by other women. He says, um, he's shouting at her, come on, get in the car. Uh, and he began to slide, slide across the driver's seat. He saw in a flash that another white student, Sue Harmon, uh, whom he had not seen before, had dived into the back. Wilbur barked, still absorbing blows, she, she shouted, mister, this is not your fight. He's trying to save this woman. Get away from here, you're going to get killed. Siegenthaler jumped back outside, where people were climbing over his car. Get in the damn car, he shrieked to Wilbur. Wilbur, not sure who Siegenthaler was, kept insisting, that, um, s insisting during the struggle that she was nonviolent and did not want to get anybody hurt. So if anything, hopefully that demonstrates the intensity of the freedom riders. Um, people were really, really sacrificing their life. They were making this ultimate sacrifice for change, not only in the South, but the way that people were just dealing with each other, the way that people were conceptualizing race um, and really challenging the violence. Um, okay, so hopefully that gives you an idea that CORE and Nashville students uh, were, were sincerely dedicated to purposeful nonviolence. Um, and then SCLC and Nashville students in Birmingham also pushed forward, um, oh great, I'm all um, pushed forward uh, this nonviolence in the civil rights movement. But there were other, uh, there were other factions also of the, of the civil rights movement and their feelings about nonviolence. Ella Baker, who I keep mentioning, um, and SNCC, for example, were more dedicated to strategic nonviolence. And even though I'm picking up a book and reading it, this one's a lot shorter. Let's grab it. Um, it says, another philosophical position that distinguished Baker from King was the issue of, oh, wait, let me turn this one. Uh, was the issue of nonviolence. It says, um, and she, it's a quote from her. It says, mine was not a choice of, well, it's, excuse me, mine was not a choice of nonviolence per se. Um, Baker indeed questioned the capacity of nonviolence to serve a philosophical basis on which to build a movement, even while she was working for the SCLC. So Baker, although an intensely significant leader in this movement, ha certainly had her doubts about the impact or the usefulness of nonviolence. And you could see this as SNCC developed and, and worked further and further, moved further and further away from nonviolence. Um, that, that this issue was not something that was set in stone, that this was not strictly a nonviolent movement, although nonviolence was intensely, intensely influential in this movement. Um, finally, we had, not finally, we had also the NAACP was involved. They had, uh, of course, different legal battles that were, in, um, that were going on. And, 
watching it full time. Okay. Um, and we had other factions that were developing as, this, that as the movement went on. We had black nationalists, pan-Africanists, um, socialists, and the list goes on. People who began to become involved in the movement but had different ideological perspectives. So with this, it is indeed, nonviolence was certainly uh, involved in the civil rights movement, but it was an idea that was contested and different leaders had different perspectives um, on how it should be used. Um, and finally, and I'll try to make this quick. The civil rights movement was uh, for the civil rights of black Americans. And certainly it was. Lynchings certainly did drop. Facilities were integrated. Civil rights legislation was passed. Overt and direct racism were certainly did become unacceptable. Um, but it was also for the radical reconstruction of society, okay? So directly out of the civil rights movement came the feminist movement. Um, the LGBT movement was certainly inspired by the civil rights movement. Disabled rights, certainly. The student movement, Mario Savio was involved in SNCC and got his organizing training from SNCC. The peace movement, certainly. The environmental justice movement certainly came straight out of the civil rights movement. The black feminist movement certainly came out of the civil rights movement. Um, grass rights roots organizing certainly was inspired, influenced, developed um, with the civil rights movement. Um, so it's this idea that yes, it was certainly for the civil rights of black Americans, but it was also for the radical reconstruction of society. And I'm just gonna end with two. <laughs> One is, um, this is a quote from King, and he writes, the black revolution is much more than a struggle for the rights of Negroes. It is forcing America to face all its inherited flaws, racism, poverty, militarism, and materialism. It is exposing evils that are deeply rooted in the whole society of our, in the structure of our society, and suggesting that radical reconstruction of society itself is the real issue to be faced. And that was written later in his life in 69. So by kind of hopingly, hoping to unpack these different elements um, of the top of the iceberg, hopefully we got to some more substantial ideas that this was a broader movement, that there were certainly connections between earlier movements and later movements, um, and, and also that it was a people's movement deeply inspired by this Christian spiritual leader. So, thank you. I'm uh, going to be easier to photograph because <laughs> I don't move around as much. Uh, <laughs> I just want us to be thinking about a few questions that came up for me partly while I was listening to you, Julina. And uh, these are with you will be discussing next week. The first one is this very important question of leadership. Uh, Julina was talking about King is saying, yes, I'm going to be a public figure. I'm going to be a drum major. What is a drum major actually? Am I supposed to keep me back there? And am I supposed to <laughs> be yet? Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we have virtual drum majors today, not real ones. But anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> he was going to be a drum major, but he was going to be a drum major for peace. Now, what I would like you to think about over the weekend is look back at what Gandhi said about leadership not sure I know how to point you to an exact page, but we did talk about what he considered his style of leadership to be. Remember he said that he was a general, he was, uh, but, but he said a few other things about that. And then let's go even back further and look at the Gita theory of human action as a background. I think this will be a very interesting comparison for us. Then, the second question, what is it, there's, boy, if we can come up with an answer for this question, we'll all get the Nobel Prize together. So uh, book your passage for uh, Stockholm or wherever it is that you go. But 
What is it that makes it possible for large numbers of ordinary people, people like you and me, in fact, in some ways, much less well endowed educationally, what is it that makes it possible for significant numbers of people to offer their life to a cause? It's and what uh, what is that magic that makes an action like Rosa Parks's action uh, in Montgomery become a tipping point? And this is probably a flip side of that same question. Again, I'll, I will be amazed if we have an actual answer for this question, but I think it's going to be very useful to think about. And thirdly and finally, think about the question of legitimization, legitimacy and legitimization. We haven't really talked about that. But what is it that made racism, which had been, you have to understand, not just legitimate, it had been the foundation of the social order in the South. It was the source of order. What suddenly flipped it around so that you could see see it as a source of discord? What were the actions of those people? Well, this has been a very complicated morning already, but we have a rare opportunity today to hear from somebody who worked closely with Vinoba Bhavi and who is a major figure in Gandhian struggles today, both grassroots and academic and somebody who you may be studying with if you go to do your PhD in peace and nonviolence, and a good friend of mine who is known as Prasad. <laughs> That's the first thing I always do, Prasad, is take my jacket off. Thank you. Thank morning and namaskar. It's a great privilege for me to be here with you. When I come here, I come more with uh, a vision or an idea of being a student of Professor Nagler, more like a colleague of all of you. And uh, I'm glad that such a large number of students take courses in peace and nonviolence. And in India, we have some universities offering one of the vice chancellor of a university told me the students are studying nonviolence, but they are very violent in their approach. So I had to say that uh, nonviolence can be studied not merely with a mind or with an intellect, but one has to study it with a heart, with an involvement, with sadhana, that is with practice, uh, without understanding what it is in day-to-day -day lives. I don't think we will have a real glimpse of what uh, non-violence is. In fact, I heard a lot of young people in Chicago area talking about 9-11, saying that there is so much of violence around in the society. We are really fed up with that. We are really looking for peace and non-violence. So I asked them, yes, you would like to have a society based on peace and non-violence, but is there anything like that you would like to contribute to nonviolence, or you don't want to contribute because anything cannot be just had for the asking. We have to do something. We have to pay for it. So is there anything like violence in your own day-to-day -day life? Is there any violence in the food you eat? Is there any violence in the clothes you wear or in the articles that you use? Is there any violence in the language that you use? Unless we are able to look into ourselves, unless we are able to be at peace with ourselves. We cannot really transcend that peace into a community peace, into a societal peace, and a world peace. Now, when I talk about violence, it is not merely hurting somebody with a knife or killing somebody or the 9-11 which must have killed six, 7,000 people. But don't you know that more than that number is being killed every day out of hunger, out of poverty, out of malnutrition? Can we see exploitation as a form of violence? Can we see 
hunger as a form of violence? Can we see poverty as a form of violence? Is there anybody in this world who says, I would like to remain poor? I don't think anybody says that. But the fact is that more than 50% of the population in this world, they are suffering from abject poverty. I believe that it is a system which has a vested interest in keeping such a large sections of people under perpetual poverty. So when we do courses like Peace and Nonviolence, we should be able to look for becoming a messengers of peace, messengers of justice, so that we just make a world free from anger, free from hatred, free from exploitation. And it is here I would see Gandhi who translated the mere abstract concepts of truth and nonviolence into pragmatic weapons. He used them to show the world that we can win the hearts of people. And when we look at injustice, he offered satyagraha, insistence on truth. We have only known to punish the opponent, to hurt the opponent. But whereas he said, I would like to win the opponent by my self-suffering. And it is this self-suffering which gives him the force of truth, the force of soul, the force of love. It is this kind of a force when we are able to generate in the society. Starting with an individual, we will be able to create a better world. So Satyagraha, we are now in the 100th year of the birth of Satyagraha. 9-11 we talk about, but it is that very 9-11 in the year 1906 in South Africa, this great uh, tool was invented by Gandhi and applied in South Africa and later in India. Then we also have the concept of Swaraj which has given, which is nothing but Swaraj, means rule over the self. Can I rule myself? And to rule myself, I should have self-control. I should have the control of the mind, control of the passions, the passions of greed, the passions of aggression. Unless we are able to control freedom or independence, really make no meaning. So for Gandhi, when he fought for the independence of India, it was not merely change of God or change of the rule from the British to the brown Indians, he said it should be a transformation of a real society and the relations within the society. So we should now work for a society where every individual knows how to rule himself or herself. It is that kind of freedom, it is that kind of independence that we should look at. Now for that he also talked about Swadeshi. How do you achieve that? So Swadeshi means the local economy. Whatever desires I have, can they be fulfilled with what I can have, what I can get from around here? Or should I go to the ends of the world to get what I need, what I want? So this is another very important question. So when I say I want to get something from that country or from this country, invariably we are leading into situations of violence. So it is the Swadeshi. Then he said Sarvodaya means welfare of all. And when we talk about welfare, it is uh, the kind of racism we talked about. Just what we had been listening to a presentation on civil rights movement. So why should there be a discrimination between human being and another, and another human being? Should we not see that the whole world, the whole humanity is one? One world, one humanity, and can we in fact go towards that kind of an object of the whole world converging into one single world. Why should there be this kind of denial? Why should there be this kind of segregation? Why should there be this kind of hatred? So when we talk about Sarvodaya, welfare of all, all human beings are one. And it is not only the human beings, we look for the welfare of all subhuman world, the animals, the birds, the creatures. And then even the non-living, like the hills, the ocean, the rivers, the forest, whatever it is. And it is that kind of uh, feeling when we are able to develop. 
in the form of Sarvodaya, I think we have to remember that we have come into this world only for a short period of time. Then we go away. And while we are here, we should be the guest here, not the masters. So when I come and stay with you at your house as a guest, am I playing the role of being a guest? Or am I going beyond that prescription of how to behave as a guest and become a master? Today what man is doing as far as environment is concerned is precisely that. The kind of uh, negligence, the kind of uh, recklessness that he is using the natural resources which would definitely belong to the posterity. It is a, a crime, I would say, against humanity. So I am so glad that you are all studying peace and non-violence. I am sure all these uh, wider aspects you will be studying. And should I say that I am jealous of you? <laughs> <laughs> you are students of uh, Professor Negler. And once in a while I get an opportunity of uh, meeting him, coming here. In fact, I had the privilege of coming here and speaking to the class here last time. So I would like to stop here. And now as a mark of my respect, I would like to offer something to uh, my guru. In fact, I dream that he is uh, Professor Negler is my guru or my teacher. A small list thing I just brought from India, I'd like to offer. Uh, this is a cloth uh, produced by my uh, president in the Sarvodaya movement. Sarvodaya movement is a peace movement in India. And uh, this is known as khadi, a cloth, which is made from hand spun and hand woven cloth. And our Sarvodaya movement, Andhra Pradesh state president, he has a khadi unit and he produces this. And uh, we feel uh, very peaceful. When we wear a cloth like this, I would like to offer it to my guru, Professor Negler. Thank you all very much. Come on. didn't get a chance to answer them, why don't we start there on Tuesday?